jump now to a little bit of architecture. Last summer, I journeyed along part of the Silk Route. My wife and I went to Uzbekistan, and we went to the, the ancient cities of Samarkand. And this is the Registan in Samarkand. It was built by a number of different rulers, but Ulug Beg, who was the grandson of um, Timur, or Tamerlane as we know him, he actually built this. And what was interesting, even back then in the 14th, 15th century, they, it was religious, but it also had a secular purpose as well. They wouldn't use the word secular, but the building on the right housed a lot of astronomy and geometry. And then the building on the left was just the madrasa. And so here we have, at the heart of the Silk Route, this amazing center of excellence. As Goethe says, architecture is frozen music. The monumentality of this part of the world, the architecture is, is really incredible. This is called Bibi Kanum. It's a courtyard, and um, it just shows the power of architecture. The next image is in Bukhara. When Genghis Khan came to raid Bukhara in the, I think it was the uh, 1250s, 1260s, he was about to sack the entire city. And he came up and he saw this huge tower, he'd never seen anything like it. And as he looked up, his cap, his ha hat, fell off the back of his head. And he took that as an auspicious moment to say, no, I'm not going to sack it. And he left the entire city as it was, as it is. When I was at university in Italy, I remember going to Venice quite a lot. And of course, you see the great Campanile in St. Mark's, or you go to Sharp Cathedral, and from 40 miles away you see these tall structures. And again, this sense of East and West, they all have very similar functions, whether it's the bell tower of the Campanile in Venice, or the minaret here across the desert plains. You see this as an imposing figure, almost, from many, many miles away. I mean, this is a, a, a watercolour I did of uh, the Registar. It was like a meditation for me. It was almost like painting a mandala, this, trying to go very detailed into the process of observing the tiles. It was almost like a ritual for me. It took me many, many weeks to do this. I think what's interesting about Uzbekistan, before we move further east, is um, it's such a blend between east and west. When you look at the people, you can't actually really tell whether they're, 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 they're oriental, Chinese-looking, or whether they're, they're western-looking. They're such a blend. And of course, Uzbekistan is so unusual in the sense of the Russians have controlled this sphere for the last 100 years, or oh, more actually, uh, 150, 200 years. And there was a famous burning of the veils in Bukhara in the, in the 1940s. And so Islam has a very different twist compared to the Arabian Peninsula in this part of the world. And then of course underneath all these monuments you have Buddhist, Manichaean, Nestorian, Christians, multiple layers of religion that exist in this part of the world. Well, and actually, there are Zoroastrian fire pits still in existent, existence in a lot of the mosques today in Uzbekistan. Now, that's pretty unusual, and people still burn. They still they, they worship fire. They wouldn't necessarily say that, but it still exists. They still light fire in that Zoroastrian sense, and it's little corner votive offerings you see in bits of the certain mosques in Uzbekistan. So even though it's not on paper, a, a religion that is uh, accepted by the state, it, it, in practice it still occurs. I find that very fascinating, a blending, a syncretic approach to understanding what existed before and what might come in the future. I, I also think, going back to the notion of the corpus callosum and the East meets West, we have to sometimes soften our very deductive, masculine, analytical side of our natures, uh, which can end up going towards a form of reductionism, and dare I say it, nihilism, because we are so obsessed with the component parts. Because of course, if we study the history of the West and the Enlightenment, going to the detail was very important at one point, but surely the 21st century, uh, you know, whether you take an archetypal, astrological, or cosmological approach, whatever your language, your lexicon, your cartography, we have to try and do this dance from the nuts and bolts, the structure, to the gestalt, the big picture. And until we do that, I think it's going to be messy. And I think that's really the life work for me as an artist. You know, I, I am, I'm quite a private person, so I'm not particularly comfortable making big speeches. But I really feel that is what we've all got to do in our own area of, of expertise. Whatever we do in this life, we have to be able to do the detail, but then think big picture. 
And that's part of that dance between East and West, or if, if you like, between emotional and rational. I mean, Nietzsche put it a different way. He said the dance between the Dionysian and the Apollonian. Um, Hegel said antithesis, thesis, or thesis, antithesis, synthesis. There's so many ways to articulate it, but we must get on and do it. Thank you.